I'd like to welcome everyone this morning again for our Saturday talks, which continue onwards. And uh, this morning, it's Francis that I think everybody knows. Uh, and he's been with Samata for over 40 years. And just a very brief factual background. Um, he started in the university class in Manchester, you know, when um, Charles Shaw and Keith Munnings were taking the classes and then moved to the, to the Samata, our Samata Centre in Manchester and must have been going to classes there, ad infinitum, all kinds of classes, running classes, and has been very involved in Samata and was one of the trustees um, of the Manchester Centre because we've got our own um, constitution there. And uh, he took classes in Rossendale for quite, I think that's in a way they're still carrying on with Jackie, uh, with the more experienced med meditators. Mm -hmm. and, and now is it organizing online study groups, which I'm hoping to join Francis <laughs> myself. So um, I'm going to pass over to you now, Francis, for your interesting talk, which we're all waiting for. <laughs> well, hopefully it's interesting. <laughs> Uh, of course it will be. Right. So, um, <clears throat> are you able to hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. So, um, I've been aware sometimes the sort of root of what we do or what we look at goes back, in fact, a long, a long, long way. And perhaps the sort of very the start of this talk perhaps goes back um, more than 40 years. So when I, I first started practicing and I and I and I'd, um, completed my first year, as it were, and the teacher said to us, "Ah, so in the break, you can um, you can try to become aware of the longest breath now and again in everyday life." And um, I have to be, uh, and I have to. Be, be going on a cycling holiday. But I was also very enthusiastic at that point and wanting to carry out instructions. So I tried to be aware of the longest breath, which if you're cycling is, is not, not easy. <laughs> um, in fact, it was uh, proved, 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 proved a fairly impossible task as it happened. But even so, there was one particular point I remember very clearly when something sort of clicked when even though I, I, when even though it was kind of quite a lot of exertion, there was something in the connection to the breath which was just just right. Um, uh, but I, I then went back, and I think maybe I, I the my teacher explained that in fact um, it was more the feel of the longest breath, and that it was often just for a few breaths. And I suppose since then, um, but I've always had a kind of interest in how one might bring the practice into everyday life. Um, and people who've been on, on strict practice may be aware that sometimes when you, when you do some intensive practice, or sometimes just after you have a very uh, uh, a certain sort of practice, there's a sense of the breath afterwards for a while, maybe for a period, maybe just for a few minutes, or sometimes on a week of practice, it may be for last, last for an hour or so, a kind of connection to something related to breath, perhaps a kind of calmer, calmer, smoother breath. But um, I found that personally very difficult um, to, to sustain for any length of time. Um, and I once asked, um, once asked Lance Cousins whether he thought it was possible to, to be aware of the, um, of the longest breath all the time. And he, interestingly, he paused and he then said that he thought it, he, that he thought that it probably was, but that nobody had quite worked out how to do it. Um, and that was a bit of a challenge, but that was maybe 15. 15 years ago or more. Um, but uh, and these things, I suppose, plant seeds. Um, and so 
Um, and then, in fact, about nine or eleven months ago, as sometimes happens with, with things, I was um, putting on my socks and I, I realized something about the breath. Um, and that was the, the sort of start of the, um, of the investigation. And so um, this talk is, is, is about, I suppose, a particular way of mm, becoming more aware of the breath in everyday life and of bringing something of the feel of the practice into everyday life. But it's just one, one um, possible way that this might be done. Um, so one of the, um, <clears throat> but one of the, so, so, so in fact this talk is going to be quite practical, at least in parts, you're, you're going to have to participate, or, or you'll be asked to participate, you don't have to, because I'm asking you to, to participate. But the, our awareness of the breath is, is related to the practice. We are experts in the breath because we practice. And if you think of all the thousands of hours of practice lots of people have done, there is something in us that knows a lot about the breath. Um, and that comes from doing the practice. Um, and our connection is always that bit stronger just after practice. So in fact, what I want to do is to do a short practice now um, at the start of the talk, just to, because I think it'll then be easier for people to um, take in or to try out um, some of the things uh, I'm going to suggest. Um, so, though it's at an early point for these talks, if you'd like to um, get in your position for doing practice, so, so to start with, we'll just chant the homage to the Triple Gems, and that's just a short Arahang Samma Sambuddho um, uh, verses, um, and we'll then and and we'll then do the practice, and I'll give instructions at least to to start off the practice. Um, so we'll so we'll practice for about 20 minutes um, and I will start off the practice and then you can do uh, do whatever length of breath you wish for the practice and I'll then give an instruction uh, after a period to to return back from the settling to the um, longest of counting and then I will I will ring a bell at the end. Arahang Samma Sambudu Bhagawa Udhang Bhagawandang Abhiwade Swakatu Bhagavata Dhammo Dhammang Namasam Supatipanno Bhagavato Savaka Sangro Sangam Namami So to start with, become aware um, of your body, and then of your breath, going in and going out, and lengthen the breath till it's the longest comfortable breath. Uh, 
And then, as you breathe in, have a sense of the breath filling the whole body. So entering So I'll, I'll, I'll just, I will start again. So become aware of the body and of the breath and of the, and let the breath go to the longest comfortable breath. And as you breathe in, become aware of the, of the breath entering the body and reaching every part of the body, right to the toes. So, sense of the breath filling the body and a sense of the breath throughout the body as you breathe out as well. And then as you breathe in, allow the breath to tranquilize, so to become calmer and more subtle. As you breathe in, and as you breathe out, And then start the practice with the longest of counting. And I'll indicate to return from the settling after about 15 or 20 minutes. So, um, just for a moment, then become aware of a aware of the breath, and perhaps sort of calm, calm nature of the breath, tranquil nature of the breath. So. Back to the point um, before we practiced. So when I was putting on my socks, I was trying to do it while standing on one leg. Um, and I noticed that if I became aware of the out breath as I put on the sock, it was much easier to balance. Um, and then I noticed that, in fact, um, most of the other movements one does while getting dressed or undressed, when you put your arm into a shirt, um, or you take off a jersey, are all connected to the breath. So we're always, and in fact, when you look at it more carefully, um, almost all the movements we do with our, particularly with our arms and the trunk of our body and bending over, um, are all linked to either breathing in or to breathing out. It's only when we're sat still um, or standing still, or if you're doing something at a very regular pace, so you're, say, walking on the flat, that your breath um, develops a kind of what you might call a um, normal length. Um, at all other times, the breath is, is constantly changing to fit in with your movements. Um, 
and this is um, useful for for um, for for a couple of different reasons. One of the, as you're probably aware, one of the sort of principles of this sort of practice is that when we do sitting practice, we never use the normal length of breath. So we're always using a longer or a shorter length of breath. Um, and that's because it's very difficult to be mindful of the normal length of breath. As soon as you start breathing normal length, usually um, it's, it is very hard to be mindful of it anymore. Um, but the, so the advantage certainly when we're doing things is because our the length of our breath is constantly changing, it actually makes it much easier um, to be mindful of it. Um, and so even though we breathe maybe 20,000 times a day, um, it's actually, interestingly with practice, you can at least become aware of it for short periods if you want to. And one of the um, other things is that if you're doing it everyday life, it needs to be effortless. So there shouldn't be any effort in breathing. As soon as there's any effort in breathing, it produces a slight tension and becomes difficult. Um, so it needs to happen um, naturally, at least while we're doing things. I'll come back to the situation where we are sitting still. And the other thing is it's, it's quite maybe difficult for some people at first to become aware of the breath while they're doing things. But if it is, then actually slowing down the movement can help. So this is where um, we get a bit more kind of practical. So um, what I want you to do, if it's possible, it may not be possible for everybody, but it probably will be for most people, is um, in a moment I want you to um, oh, yeah. just stand up. How much is it? How much? And as you stand up, um, I want you to notice if you do it on an in breath or an out breath. And as you sit down, to notice if you do it on an in breath or an out breath. And then I want you to stand up slowly and see again whether it's whether in fact your breath is slows down as well and do it quickly and see if it coordinates with the movement and um, so if you'd like to try that now so, so if you just as you stand up see Do it both slowly and quickly. Um, so it's slightly difficult to get feedback, but if you notice doesn't matter too much whether it was an in-breath or an out-breath, but if you notice that the movement did coincide with the in-breath or the out-breath, could you nod your head? <laughs> okay. So most people, okay, all right. So, um, but it's also, <coughs> um, and it would be the same um, if you bend over, so if you bend over from your trunk, you'd find the same thing. So um, you might now want to, it's interesting because you can actually, it's the movement which kind of triggers it. So if you'd like to make the movement as though you're going to take off your jersey, doing it this way, I know there are different ways, but, and just see if it's an in-breath or an out-breath and then put it on again. So again, did you? Yes. OK. 
okay? Um, and then I want you to um, pretend that you're in front of the fridge. Now you don't have to stand up or sit down, but then I want you to, as it were, open the door of the fridge and close it. So, so again, if you notice those movements coincided with, uh, an okay, then, then not okay. Um, and then we'll just do something else. So, um, so I want you to pretend I'm, I'm going to sort of do it at a height, but you don't have to do that. But I want you, you to imagine that you have a carrot in front of you and you have a knife and you're going to chop your carrot. Um, and at first, uh, just chop it slowly. And then do it a bit more quickly. Then you can pretend you're a professional chef and do it very quickly. So, um, <laughs> so I mean, what, what hopefully you'll have noticed is that in fact, as you did it a bit more quickly, it was still on the out breath. But when you did it very quickly, your breath um, adapted and you started to do several chops to each breath. Um, anyway, it, it's something to, that you can experiment with. Um, and it even, it's interesting because it even works with quite um, slight movements. So um, I now want you to imagine that you have a light switch in front of you. And just switch on and off the light and see if that coincides with the breath. Again, um, nod your head if you if you found that coincided. Maybe less so. Uh, some people, maybe not all. I mean, it's more. It's possibly less less kind of definite with with quite small movements. Um, so basically, all movements of your kind of trunk um, and your arms are all related to the breath. And this is interesting because it makes it much easier if you do want to become aware of the breath in everyday life, then it, it makes it um, much easier to do so. And in fact, if you, if you observe it over a little period of time, you'll notice there's almost like a kind of, it's a kind of dance between the movement and the breath. And the breath is constantly adapting to our movements. And it's like a kind of perfect dancing partner. Even if we change move halfway through, it'll actually adapt. It'll kind of um, correct to 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 take into account the movement. So that's when you're moving. But then when you're sitting um, and you're still, then the breath will usually settle to a um, a kind of regular length, um, or what you might call a, a normal length. Um, so in fact, just now for a moment, just as you're listening, try and become aware <coughs> of the breath. Don't, don't try and control it, but just try and become aware of the, of the in-breath and the out-breath. So, so often you can for short periods of time, but it's as soon as you start concentrating on something, it's quite easy to lose it. Um, and so while you're sitting, you, you need to do, or probably for lots of people, you need to do something else as well. So you need to 
Um, so it's not quite the normal breath. And there are different things you can do. So you can either make the breath um, a little bit longer. If you just want to try that, just as you're sitting, just make the length just a little bit longer. Probably with your eyes open if you can. So sort of more normal. Or another thing you could do would be to um, have a sense of the breath going down to your feet. So just try that for a moment, just as you're listening and without your eyes closed, but just while you're paying attention. can become aware of a more tranquil breath. Um, so again, just try letting it breath become more tranquil. And so in in situations where you're kind of sitting in that way, and this can also be when you're sitting listening or you're looking at a computer screen or you're reading, um, in order to be aware of the breath, you usually have to kind of establish it, um, as establish that, that sort of extra um, quality to the breath besides being aware of whether it's an in-breath or an out-breath. Um, and the other situation um, is walking. So again, if we're walking on the flats, then our breath tends to, to go to a sort of more normal length after a short while. Um, and again, in order to become aware of it, then um, sometimes you can just become aware of it or you may like to add some extra quality and certainly something that Boonman does is to add the quality of a sight and sense of um, meta or goodwill towards others as you walk. So as you breathe in, you have a sense of goodwill towards yourself and as you breathe out, a sense of goodwill towards others. So um, I suppose one of the questions is, um, why would we do this? And I think that's a very reasonable question. I mean, in fact, the sort of the magical thing about the sort of practice we do is that in fact, if you just do the practice every day, it has an enormous effect. So you don't in fact have to do anything extra. And this is a sort of, additional things, people, something additional people, thing people are interested, might wish to do. But in fact, just on its own, the practice will, will still have the effect. Um, but it's quite interesting that the, I was looking up some of the um, things that the Buddha says about breathing mindfulness, um, and he is fairly it's interesting. So I'm just going, going to quote um, so this breathing mindfulness concentration bhikkhus developed and repeatedly practiced is peaceful and sublime, unadulterated and of happy life. It causes to vanish at once um, and suppresses evil and unprofitable thoughts as soon as they arise. Um, and again, um, if you are asked in what way of life does Gotama mainly dwell during the main's retreat in breathing mindfulness concentration. And another quote, were it bhikkhus, rightly speaking to be said of anything, this is the life of the noble ones. This is the life of purity. This is the life of the Tathagata. It is a breathing mindful, mindfulness indeed, that rightly speaking, it should be said, this is that life. 
Um, so, I mean, there is something very powerful about the breath and something clearly even beyond being more mindful. If that's what Buddhas do when they're, um, when they're on retreat. Um, and it's often uh, one of the other things it is recommended for is um, for is, is for reducing thinking. <clears throat> and you might have noticed while we were doing <coughs> those movements, or you might <coughs> want, want to want to try again at home. But it's remarkably effective at reducing internal chatter. As soon as you become aware of the in-breath and out-breath, a lot of the internal chatter disappears. And that, in a sense, and, and particularly if sometimes people have the habit of having a slightly um, sort of slight um, critical thoughts, either of themselves or um, of other people, and it's very helpful for um, reducing that and kind of breaking through that. Um, and it is, if you do it even for a few minutes, it can be very, um, very peaceful, in fact. You get a, a sense of something. Um, so, um, so I suppose, and it, it, it is interesting, I mean, in fact, this is sort of, it is in a sense known more widely in the world, but we don't hear about it. So I mean, lots of, particularly in sport, people use the in-breath and the out-breath to actually do things more skillfully. So skiers will be taught to be aware of the out-breath as they turn, for instance weightlifters are taught to use the breath and almost anything in almost anything if we become aware of the breath and the in-breath and the out-breath it will somehow go more smoothly. I was at um, Green Street the other day and I was sawing this branch and it was getting stuck in the way green branches sometimes do and as soon as I became aware of the in-breath and the out-breath it was almost kind of magical the saw just slid through the branch. Um, and you may find that with actually many tasks, and particularly slightly tricky tasks, if as you're doing them you become even just briefly aware of the in-breath number, um, it may help things go more smoothly. And you can, this is sort of this more to do with kind of skillful means if you like, but um, almost lots of different things one does um, if you you become aware of it or you work with it so it will be better i noticed i my hand tended to shake slightly when i took pictures um, but if i press the press the camera just at the start in breath it's much better and there are 101 things one may do in life where actually the breath may uh, may help to do it better or more skillfully. Um, so the, the then comes the question of, of um, how to do this. Um, and we, as I mentioned, we probably breathe in and out at least 20,000 times a day. So um, we're not immediately going to become aware of all our in-breaths or out-breaths. Um, so in fact, for most people, there's probably a hierarchy of situations in which it's easier or harder to become aware of the breath. And so familiar tasks, tasks where you're doing some repetitive movements, such as um, in the kitchen, chopping, sweeping, anything where the same movement is repeated, it's hidden. And can be easier to become aware of the breath. And you don't necessarily have to become aware of both the in-breath and the out-breath. I mean, if you're weeding, you may just become aware of the in-breath as you 
and she was there. She didn't remember her forever. And you kind of pluck the weed, so you don't have to be aware of both. Even one is enough. Um, but to start with, choose something that you that will be easy, and just try and do it for a kind of for for a few minutes, for no longer. Um, uh, and then, or kind of getting dressed, putting your clothes on. There are lots of different situations um, uh, where you might like to try it, but probably trying kind of one or two to start with um, is a good way to start. Um, and um, the other, but it is, I'd have to say that for some people it, it is quite a difficult thing to do. Certainly when I um, started trying when I started trying to come aware of the breath, I mean, I, I would, or I was, or even doing other mindfulness practices, I would, if I, if I think at the start of, um, if I think at, uh, at the start of meal right, I'm going to try to become mindful of eating. I'm the sort of person who, two mouthfuls from the end, suddenly realizes that I, I haven't been aware at all of the meal uh, of my eating. Um, but there's a sort of, I've recently been investigating so it's the four bases of success. Um, and there's a particular technique related to that, which I found does make it much easier. So if you're somebody like that. So what you do is you need to um, become aware for um, just a moment of your feet on the ground and of some calm, stable place within yourself. Um, and you then make, as it were, the wish, as it were, I'm, I'll try to be aware of my breath to, to the end of the road or, or whatever it is that you want to do. Um, and then when you put the effort in to to initiate it and to actually do it, it does seem it's much easier to keep the mind on it, or even if your mind moves off, then it will come back again. Um, and obviously doing these things in a way that's sort of proportionate and, um, and realistic is important. So just for a few minutes is enough. Um, So, so and sometimes for some things you have to, it's a question of sort of playing with it really and experimenting. So I mean, if you want to, becoming aware of the breath while reading is actually quite difficult, or I find quite difficult. Um, but um, to, if you want to practice, then you, if you choose a book that's not too exciting and it's not too, um, involving if you like or even a page um, and you set up some awareness of the breath for a particular slightly longer breath and then try reading something and it's almost you you may not read in quite the same way as the problem um, it's all but, but but just see if you're actually taking the information or not um, and it may actually be quite they, they have a slightly different effect um, and the same on the computer, and computers are quite difficult, so you have to have to set something up beforehand if you want to spend even five minutes probably looking at the computer and being aware of your breath. Um, and so if you're doing something else like that, you're doing something where you're stationary, either you become aware of a longer breath or the breath at your feet, or a more true, or um, or of or, or a more tranquil path. So all those will be helpful. Um, so, um, so that's probably um, most of what I I want to 
say for the moment about it. Um, I think it is, as I said, it is something just to be, it isn't, it isn't necessary, but it, it can be an interesting thing to do and it can um, certainly give quite a lot of peace sometimes, just for a few minutes doing, um, doing practical activities. But it's certainly much easier when you start to do it with things where you're moving where you're doing some sort of kind of regular movement. Um, and perhaps just notice the effect um, and see how you find it. So I think that's probably all I want to say for the moment, but um, I'm very happy to take questions from anybody. Veronica, mm -hmm. will you? Yes, I will. Uh, Roberta? Keep yeah. an eye. <laughs> Roberta, right. so you unmute yourself. Just okay, to... okay. Um, yes, well, since I, we did that day retreat a couple of months ago, I've been working with it quite mm. a lot. Um, I find it a really interesting practice. Um, and I guess it is just practice, but sometimes um, I notice a different quality. Some, either I'm not with breath at all, or it felt like um, I was too, you know, I was too much in the breath. And just, just sometimes, yeah. and it is quite rarely, um, it feels as though it's, it drops into a much more natural place of, of kind of yes. knowing the breath yes. and being able to do things as well. And I was just wondering whether yeah. there's a way of developing that further, because it just feels completely different in some way. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm just interested in that. Mm. I, I, I think that's a very good point. And I think it's part of the, the sort of difficulty is that when you, you may very subtly start trying to breathe, um, and the more you can just let the breath come on its own, then the easier and the more kind of natural it is. Um, and I think uh, as, uh, uh, as Roberta says, there are different sort of stages to it. And there's sometimes when it seems to become very, may become even for a few minutes, very kind of smooth and easy. Um, and it's just, practicing it and, and doing it perhaps um, with different things as well can help. Um, yeah. Hi, uh, thank you Francis. Um, I've been working with this for a while as well. Um, <clears throat> I've been on courses of mindfulness in everyday life with Les. It's something he, you know, does a lot I think. Um, I've definitely done it in the, with a completely wrong effort <laughs> many times. Uh, I think the first wrong effort I did for me was to try and concentrate too much on the touching point here and then be over-concentrated with it and not be able to do anything. And at some point, stopping breathing altogether because I wasn't aware of it. <laughs> I was holding my breath. So I, I sort of, that took a while to get through. So eventually I think I settled to more of uh, the notice vaguely sort of subtle noticing of the, of the diaphragm moving in and out but sometimes also the chest area um, and I wondered whether there was a particular point that you felt uh, was better in everyday life to notice the breath going in and out of the body. Um. I think it, I suspect that it's probably very, very variable for different people. Um, possibly um, being aware of the rise and fall of the abdomen, as it were, or it's not actually quite the abdomen, there's a sort of area just underneath the rib cage, which actually does, because, it, because the abdomen may not move unless you take quite a deep breath. But being aware um, of that area may be helpful for some people. Um, 
maybe generally of the chest, but it's um, it's sort of working out for yourself, I think, what enables you to become like, it's just, it's just separating in-breath from out-breath, that's all um, you need to do. Um, nothing more than that, so you don't need to become aware of it all the time or anything like that. Just what is in-breath and what is out-breath. Is that Marjorie? It's more a comment, Francis. Um, I, I've often found myself um, perhaps walking along the street, lots of people and buses and what have you, or standing at bus stop waiting for the bus, and in both situations feeling negativity. And then I've um, done exactly what you've, you, you've been suggesting. I just come back to my breath and my feet. Um, so if I'm walking, then I'm aware of my feet walking and my, and my breath, my breathing um, as I go along, or similarly if I'm standing at the bus stop. And what I've found invariably is that my whole mood changes from being irritated with what's around me mm. and uh, you know, negative about it all mm. suddenly i find i'm just at peace with it mm. and um it's a really really ex good way to sort of change from um uh, unpleasant feelings to pleasant mm. feelings mm -hmm. uh, very useful i think mm -hmm. yeah thank you good. tracy yeah. Unmute, Tracy. Unmute yourself. I won a moment ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's this magic mute and unmuting. Uh, yes, I was going to say something very similar to Marjorie. I find it very powerful as well. And sometimes you become aware of it kind of spontaneously. And the last couple of days, I've rejoined a gym. So I haven't been going to the gym and doing that type of exercise for, well, at least six months. And I was quite amused yesterday to notice the dance that uh, Francis was describing between the breath and the body. Because I was doing things I wasn't familiar with, I was kind of watching the body adjust to the breath and the breath adjust to the body. So there was a sense of ease. And when it kind of got out of sync and they were out of step, it was really quite strong um, and you could really feel them trying to work together for that kind of lovely, peaceful um, being at ease that can arise when you're aware of the breath in that, that way. So, yeah, that was interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a good point. I think things where you... Activity which will make you quite short of breath is quite a lot more difficult because you just let, need to sort of need to let it happen to a large extent and not interfere. Mm. Um, and that sometimes that's quite difficult to do because if you start interfering even a little bit, it may make you feel more short of breath. Um, mm. But if you do manage just to become aware of it, you can then sometimes very slightly lengthening the out breath or other things like that may actually make you able to exercise more easily. Yeah. So, Richard? Um, <clears throat> what I heard what you said about the using the saw um, and uh, I know exactly what you mean. There's something about that um, giving attention to the breath, doing a physical act yeah. like that, where it's you sort of hit the point where it's perfectly rhythmic and, and smooth, and it's the, the breath going with it. If you don't do that, it, it, you get stuck, don't you? Or it, you put too much effort in, or and it makes the job so much easier. <clears throat> um, but uh, another, <coughs> excuse me, another garden-based um, activity or land-based. I've, I've noticed, and I've tried to do this many times, this is mowing the lawn. And I really have tried to 
uh, give attention to that without letting the mind run to its thoughts, etc. Uh, uh. And it seems very, very hard to the point where I've kind of given up. I don't know whether it's to do with the, it's more strenuous, there's noise, I'm um, sort of pushing something and guiding it rather than just working with it. Um, it just seems that particular thing, it, the more I, the more I try to go to the breath and calm the mind, the more active the mind becomes. It's almost counterproductive. Well, it's a strange thing. I wonder what, uh, if you have any thoughts about you know, doing more vigorous activities. Mm. So, so um, well, if you want to try, I think, I think that's right. I mean, it took me, it took me months to be able to be aware of, of, the, of the breath as I walked down the street. <laughs> I'm a bit of a, a slow learner with these things. And then I, as I at, a, at a day, I, I gave the instruction to other people and they immediately did it. It's interesting. So it's um, very variable. But if you have a task like that where it's difficult, the, I suggest just before you start doing um, what I suggested of sort of um, once you have the mur out and, uh, and you're kind of ready, feeling the feet on the ground and a kind of stable place and making the sort of wish to be aware of the breath going up and down the next three times, as it were. And then as you set off, um, just actually pay quite, don't sort of look around or pay much attention, too much attention to the mowing. To see if you can become aware of the first in breath and out breath um, without paying attention to anything else. Sometimes to start with, you may have to sort of concentrate on it. Quite hard to start with in order to do it. So, I'd be interested. I've only got one well left this summer, so <laughs> I'll make the most yeah, of it. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. Is that Tony? Tony James? Can you unmute Tony? Yes, I, Lance once said to me that I should watch whether I went to sleep on an in-breath or an out-breath. I wonder whether you think this is actually possible or whether it's just the process of trying that's important. Mm -hmm. um. I suspect that it would be possible, mm -hmm. um, but I think you, you're right with many of those things, it's what you have to do in order to do it for the first time, which is the most useful mm -hmm. part of it. Um, but certainly just for becoming aware of the breath, just as you lie down and you go to sleep, even for a minute or two, and as you wake up in the morning, um, can be very useful. Thanks. Well, there's Paul. Um, I, I Paul back. That... Paul. Okay, Paul. Unmute. Thanks, Francis. Um, yes, I was, I was just thinking about some of the things that makes it quite a challenge for me, um, having that awareness of the breath. And I think sometimes it's the... Um, the sort of breath in the body. So it sort of most opens up a world of feeling and sensation. And it starts to get quite complicated because one sort of can notice, um, you know, sort of tensions or I can notice energy building and, you know, it, the mind can go in all sorts of different places. So I think what I found quite helpful in your talk is the sort of, firstly, keeping it quite simple. So whether it's an in-breath or an out-breath, but certainly my experience is that it can start off quite simple and then go in all sorts of different directions. It then makes it difficult to maintain the initial mm. intent to just be aware of the breath. Mm. I think that's where doing it with, um, with, with um, physical movement is very useful. And even just try a few times, just opening something, closing it, um, and you you can quite quickly get a, a, a sort of feel for for a slightly different way of doing it. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I agree, if you, if you just try to do it and without movement, it's actually very difficult. Francis, I wanted to 
um, ask about childbirth <laughs> um, because um, I remember going to NCT classes. This was before I ever came to, uh, some, to, to meditation. And we learned a lot of breathing techniques to help us through child work. And it did seem to work um, from my recollection. And, um, and my daughter Lucy is expecting a baby in a few weeks time. And we've been practicing uh, uh, mindfulness of breathing uh, we meet every week and we do this and and um, I know that it can be useful but I don't I don't want to promise that we'll sort, sort everything out but I know there is some way in which it calms and tranquilizes um, so uh, I just wonder what you thought about that really um, because it is quite a powerful ally you know to have something like that and, and it can matter and make a difference so um, I suppose um, there's sort of two aspects or two, two things occur to me I mean one of the aspects of childbirth is sort of being able to relax with contractions um, and then just to become aware of the in-breath and probably a longer in-breath and out-breath mm -hmm. as, as a kind of wave of contraction comes um, yeah. and goes would be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and then if one's actually pushing, mm -hmm. then obviously you're taking, and this is any time you're pushing, you're taking a short in-breath yes. yeah. and then a longer out-breath. Yeah. Just, just to become aware of the of the in breath and the out breath, um, mm -hmm. and that's all almost all you need to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it's great. Uh, you... Yeah, I think it's good that we've got that technique to, you know, um, mm -hmm. to offer because um, I think uh, it's yeah. something we can do together as well. Yeah. So yeah, I'm glad you think it'll be helpful. Thank you. Deborah, I think. Deborah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm really interested in um, why it works, and just something that came to mind that I don't know if you what your thoughts are or chances are is I wonder if what we're doing when we when we're aware of the breath is for one thing we have to explore right effort because it only really works if you do it with right effort, and I'm wondering as well if because it disrupts thinking whether also one becomes a bit more aware of the state of the mind because I'm quite interested in I, I too have found it quite difficult over the years to be too aware because I've tried too hard of the breath in a kind of heavy kind of way but I quite like this idea of just being aware of the feel of the longest breath because that yeah. seems to yeah. then make me much more aware of the mind sort of takes it back somehow yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, I think that's right, and that is a kind of different way, a, a slightly a, a kind of variation on it, just to be aware of the feeling. And I mean, the thing about breathing is it's natural, and it's always there. We never stop. It's always present. Um, and for the vast amount of time, unless we're deliberately altering our breath, it happens as sort of autonomic, uh, as... Um, as an automatic process. So there's something very natural about it. And maybe it's that when we key into something that is very natural within ourselves, um, it keys into other things to do with the mind and body, which also may be kind of naturally um, skillful, I suppose. Um, it's a thought. Yeah. Thank you. Hmm. For Santa. For Santa. Can you unmute for Santa? Unmute. Yeah. I have been doing the Tai Chi practice. The practice is always associated with in breath and out breath. I find, but doing Tai Chi helps me to reduce any physical pain I've had before. I find it very, very useful. 
because it's always associated, all the moments in Tai Chi are associated with in breath and out breath. You are conscious yeah. of it. Yeah. Uh -huh. So it helps with the pain very much. Mm. Yes, I, 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 can, I can believe that. Yeah. Very, it, it's very, the other thing about the breath is it, so there's something very powerfully healing about it. Um, if you become aware of the in breath, the out breath, something um, will tend to physically relax. Um, and um, yes, my impression is there is something very healing. I wonder if it is the chi that is going through the body, the chi, the, I don't know. Do you Maybe, know I, I mean, and from that point of view, you will know and better than I, I suspect. I don't, it's, it, it isn't quite a term that I'm familiar with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Valerie, yeah. I was going to say much the same as, as the Santa. By the way, the breath, the chi is like the prana or the, the sort of life force. So it uh, okay. yeah, yeah. uh, flows, flows through us. But um, one thing is that in Tai Chi, we breathe in, in through the nose, but out through the mouth, which, is, which I'm pretty sure is what I was told to do as a child. Um, and... Uh, but uh, of course, during, during this, the sitting practice, we, we're taught to breathe in and out through the nose. And that, that's kind of become a habit in daily life as well. But I, I perhaps because of the Tai Chi experience, when, when I'm out and about, sometimes I, I, I do find it easier to, to uh, be aware of the breath if, if I breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. So uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Um, I, I think... Sometimes it is easier to be aware of the breath if you if you do something extra. Um, and yeah. what you're describing is kind of is perhaps one of the extra things you could do. But you mm -hmm. can't. Um, it's difficult. It's useful for us for a short while, but but yeah. usually not to sustain it. I would say. In fact, I don't usually follow the in breath and the in breath with the nose and out breath with the um, mouth. I don't do that in Tai Chi, but I get the defect out of it. I must say it to Valerie. Yeah. yeah as I long as it works. <laughs> yeah. Exhale through the mouth. Take only through the nose. In, in breath and out breath through the nose only. But still it works. That's good. Luan? Just one more thing on Tai Chi. Um, we've just done it this morning for a start. Um, in the Tai Chi movements, uh, the in-breath, the movements are going towards the body, and the out-breath, the movements are going away. And that's all the way through the form. Just to let you know. <laughs> so, so on the in-breath, the movement's going towards the body. Yeah. yeah. Towards, yeah. Towards, or, towards or up. Yeah, then, yeah, yeah. But I think that's, I mean, I think that's what you may find happens naturally with movement. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is that Eileen? Eileen, unmute? Yes, I've unmuted. Um, I was just going to say, um, I find in situations where I might become very tense otherwise. For example, sitting in the dentist chair and they're just about to drill. <laughs> and particularly um, on, a, on an occasion when I had a camera down to, you know, for an examination and I was told that I might find this very difficult and there would be gagging and so on. I just go to the longest of counting. And it's absolutely wonderful. It just, I, I'm always able to just relax the body. And I think the question about um, childbirth, mm. it, it may be helpful to, to practice the longest of counting. Yeah. I remember when I was 
I was um, getting ready for my first baby. We went, we had a course called psychoprophylaxis. <laughs> <laughs> and they taught us that the, the practice, you practiced for ages beforehand, um, tensing up one muscle in the body and learning to let all the other muscles be, be relaxed, which is kind of a bit, you know, it, was, it wasn't really real. But we, what we were really doing was psychologically preparing for when one part of the body was becoming very tight and very, very stressed, very difficult, not to go with it. And the technique that we were taught to help with that was to just learn something very simple, like a nursery rhyme, which you and your birthing partner, partner would then say together. In my case, it was Mary had a little lamb. <laughs> and we were just, as soon as the contraction started, and I had this thing about don't go with it, don't go with it. And just holding my, the hand of my birthing partner, we just start. Mary had a, and keep it slow <laughs> and it reminds me now of the longest of counting because you are put, it, you know it, just the, the counting and the slowness of it having that practiced in your in your kind of kit bag really that you know it so well mm -hmm. um, I just thought of it really Veronica when you were asking your question I think it's yeah. quite a I think we're going to, we've been practicing, <laughs> we have been, so hopefully we can use it, yeah. It's and it's that thing of not going with the, going with the tension, traction, not taking the rest of the body with you, because yeah. yeah. that's what makes the pain worse, yeah. holding onto it, you know. Yeah. It's important to know that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There is an actual short parita for, for childbirth. <laughs> How lovely. <laughs> which you could remember. It's called the Angulimala parita. Because if you remember, Angulimala was, uh, was actually had been a, a criminal before he was a monk. But when he, when he became a monk, he left all that behind. And one, one day he helped a woman who was having a difficult childbirth. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and it's, quite a, it's quite a short Pali blessing. Um, yeah. Sort of, may, you know, maybe you you be well, and may your baby yeah. be be well. So I, I I'm happy to dig it out for you. Or Fran Francis, Francis, you may know, Francis yes. may know it from his monk days. Yeah. No, I, I don't. No, no childbirth experiences. <laughs> <laughs> but the longest of counting to see how useful it might be.